Good morning, everyone. It's so good to see y'all. Welcome to City Light, where everyone is welcome. Nobody's perfect, and anything is possible. How are y'all doing? Good? Awesome. Well, we are so glad that you are here with us this morning. If you want to go ahead and stand up, we're going to have some fun this morning. We're going to, let's get clapping. Let's celebrate. Today is a good day. Today is the day that the Lord has made. Let's rejoice. for this day we're gathered in your name calling out to you your glory like a fire awakening desire will burn our hearts with you you're the reason we're here you're the reason we're singing open up the heavens we want to see What a 
Thank you so much for bringing us here today. 
Um, thank you for giving us this time of worship where we can just prepare our hearts, God, and we pray that you would prepare our hearts as Josh prepares to give us this message, Lord. We pray that you would just fill everyone's hearts here, God. We pray that you would fill this room with your presence, and we pray that you would just speak to us and speak through Josh today as he brings us this message, Lord. We thank you so much again. In your name we pray. Amen and amen. Why don't you give a COVID high five to someone next to you there. Praise the Lord we get to be in church this morning. It's going to be a great day. Thank you, worship team. I, I love, uh, man, yeah, it was wonderful. Appreciate you guys leading us. Well, I'm super excited about today. You guys are looking good, and that's always a good start. When, when everybody's looking good, that, that's, a good, that's a good start. Today, we are in part two of a brand new series. Hey, good to see you from out of town. Uh, history makers, and I, I'm looking forward to where we're going to go with this. But in case you were not here last week, we're going to take the next few weeks, and we're going to look through Scripture at some of the Bible's greatest history makers of all time. And I'm praying that you and I are inspired. I'm praying that our faith lifts, that it rises, and that God uses this time to call out history makers among us to change the course of history in our families, in our communities, in, in this city and beyond. So last week we got the conversation started with a question. We asked this question, when I say history maker, what name or what face comes to mind. So we thought about that, and then we put out a follow-up question. Okay, what was it that made that person a history maker? What was it about them? Why did they rise to the occasion? Why, why were they history makers? And that's a question that I was asking myself entering into this season as a nation and looking at this series, because I believe that God is looking for history makers today. I believe that God is looking for people who want to join him in his work. The Lexicon Dictionary defines history maker as a person who influences the course of history or does something spectacular or worthy of remembrance. And it goes without saying that there are history makers on both sides of history, aren't there? There's the Mother Teresas and the William Tyndales who have brought heaven to earth, and there are the Adolf Hitlers and the Osama bin Ladens who have released hell on earth. And so we said for our purposes in this series, we are focusing on history makers that moved the world from where it was to where God wanted it to be. So we're talking God's ground shakers, momentum shifters, devil throat punchers, history makers that moved the world from where it was to where God wanted it to be. And this gets me revved up because as a church, our mission statement is to move people from where they are to where God wants them to be. We want to be history makers. And the fundamental thought beneath our mission statement is this truth that God is in charge, that he has a purpose, a plan, an agenda that he is carrying out in this world. We might say it this way, a story that he's writing. It is, after all, all his story. Amen? Amen? It's all his story. And since history is his story, if you belong to him, if you are his, you are his story. Your choices, your decisions, they all matter. You were meant to be history makers. It's who you are. And isn't it, this is so amazing to me, it's humbling that, that God would decide that his story would be written through your story. God decided that, that his story would be written through my story. Let that sink in for a moment. You are his story. So every moment matters. Every decision matters. There is no neutral ground in God's story. In fact, C.S. Lewis said it this way. He said, there is no neutral ground in the universe. Every square inch, every split second is claimed by God and counterclaimed by Satan. What a statement. It's powerful. It reminds me of Jesus' statement when he said, you are either with me or you are against me. 
And I just wonder, what side of history are you on? Last week, Joshua, at the very end of his life, he said to the people, choose this day whom you will serve. But as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. And what I hope you'll understand today is that your choices matter. What you do with your life matters. You're a history maker. And God has an agenda for this world, but so does Satan. God has an agenda for your life but so does Satan. And so if you sign up to be a history maker, you need to understand that there's no neutral ground. In your spiritual life, there's, it's, it's not a playground, it's a battleground. There's no neutral ground. You're either with Jesus or you are against him. And watch this, the primary battlefield is in your mind. It's in your mind. Today, we're gonna look at the life of a history maker who is riddled with doubt. In his mind, he just isn't enough. In his mind, he doesn't have what it takes. And I hope that this is encouraging to your faith to know this, that God still used him. And whether we like it or not, doubt is something that every history maker will face. Doubt is something that every history maker is going to have to fight. From the start, the enemy of your soul will sow seeds of doubt into your mind. And it'll say things like, oh, you're just, uh, you know, fill in the space. Fill in the blank. You're just a whatever. And it will be custom fit to your story. In fact, right now, I don't even have to complete that sentence because it's a lie you're all too familiar with. You've heard it all your life. Oh, you're just, uh, what is it? And the accuser's goal is to plant doubt deep into your heart. That's step one. I'm going to plant doubt deep into their heart. Oh, I'm no history maker. I'm just a nurse. I'm just a kid. I'm just a, a, an old person. And if, this, if, if your enemy has done his job right, you will believe a lie as if it were the truth. That's step two. Instill doubt in their minds and get them to believe a lie as if it were the truth. I could never be a history maker. I'm just, and here's the great tragedy. A lie we believe to be true will affect our lives as if it were true. Did you catch that? A lie that we believe to be true will affect our lives as if it were true. That's the power of a lie. And if the father of lies, if he can just get you to doubt God, to doubt his word, he can take you out. I'm telling you, Satan loves to spread doubt like a bad germ. Doubt is contagious. I mean, it can move from one person to another person, or it can move from one area of your life to another area of your life. And doubt, it, 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 just like in an, in an athletic team, any good coach will tell you this. If one player, if one key player quits believing that the team can win, if they start to have doubt, soon that doubt will spread throughout the rest of the team like a wildfire, and what they believe becomes their reality. What you believe matters. And some of you, you've experienced this dynamic in your own life, maybe with a spouse or with a peer at work or a friend who's just full of doubt. All the time, just full of doubt. And don't you just wish we could wear a mask that would filter out doubt? I mean, like, like the masks that we're wearing around town, they're supposed to filter out germs. Well, our history maker today, he struggled with doubt. And we'll get to him in just a moment. But there's something to be said about doubt and this germ comparison before we dive in. Isn't it interesting that if your body encounters a germ and it defeats it, you are actually better off because of it. That that's what a, an evac a vaccination essentially is, right? Just a, just a little bit of the germ and you develop a resistance. And then whatever it is that takes other people down, keeps them out of work for a week, it doesn't bother you because you've developed a resistance. Well, the same is true about doubt. Doubt can be deadly. It can kill a marriage. It can divide friends. It can end a business deal. It can take out your faith. It can take out a team from being in contention. Doubt is contagious. 
But there's also a benefit to doubt. If you are willing to do the hard work of defeating doubt, the very thing that was meant to take you out can become a vaccination of faith. Think about it. A marriage, it weathers the storm of doubt. And the marriage, the love in the marriage comes back stronger than ever, doesn't it? Or a friendship that holds on through the drama of middle school will be stronger in high school, won't it? Uh, A faith that fights through a season of doubt will resurface stronger than ever before. And that's what we're going to see today in the life of our history maker. Last week, we looked at Joshua for our our first history maker. And this week, we're going to move to the book of Judges. So we're just flipping two pages, Fran. And we're going to look at the life of Gideon. And Joshua's last words to Israel were, keep going. Don't quit. Keep on fighting. Stay faithful to God's word. Stay faithful to him. Trust him and obey him. And and they did, you know, kind of, for a little while. And the truth is that some of them did, but many did not. And in Judges chapter 1, we learn that some of God's people, they thought they knew better than God. And how many of you know that never goes well? It doesn't go well in my life. It doesn't go well here in Judges chapter 1 because their sin and the consequences of their decisions, it became this awful cycle in the history of the Israelites. It was a problem, a serious problem. And just like God provided a person as an answer to the problem last week, this week, our history maker Gideon is God's answer to the problem. Can we all say Gideon? Gideon, Gideon, just making sure you're with me still. Gideon, he was the fifth judge of Israel after Joshua's death. And here's what would happen. The people would obey God for a generation, and then the next generation would come and they would forget about God. And so God would have to discipline his children and they would repent, and God would send in a person who would deliver them from their their problem. And this would happen over and over and over again. Enters Gideon. Except Gideon isn't your typical hero. In his mind, He's the last person on the list of history makers that God might use. Gideon doubts himself. And if you read Judges chapter 6 and chapter 7, you'll see that he not only doubted himself, he often doubted God. But God was patient with Gideon in his doubt. And in the end, Gideon will go from zero faith to a hero of the faith and he defeats the doubt in his own mind. In fact, by the end, the people want Gideon to be king. It's pretty impressive, but we're getting ahead of ourselves. Gideon's history, maker, history making days, they begin with a problem. If you've got your Bibles, we're going to be in Judges chapter 6. The word should, co- should come on the screen. The text says this. It says that the Israelites did evil in the Lord's sight. Just mark it down. Sin is always, always, always the problem. It's the problem that God calls his history makers to overcome. And God is always working out his broader redemptive story, even when we don't understand it, even when we can't see what he's doing. Watch what he does. The Israelites did evil in the Lord's sight, so the Lord handed them over to the Midianites for seven years. Like, who are the Midianites? Well, the Midianites were an enemy of the Israelites that they had defeated. The Israelites had defeated the Midianites 250 years prior, but they hadn't completely destroyed them. And now this enemy has resurged. They've regained their ancient power and they've joined forces with the Amalekites to make war against the Israelites. And because of their, because of their sin, God does not fight for Israel. Instead, he hands them over. He hands them over to their longtime enemy, and God uses the Midianites to move his people from where they were to where God wanted them to be. Now, that's just not a fun lesson in Scripture. I mean, Josh, are you saying that God could use my enemies to make me holy? I'm not saying it. The Bible's saying it. 
Verse 2, the Midianites were so cruel that the, Israel, that the Israelites, they made hiding places for themselves in the mountains, in, in caves, in strongholds. It, it's come to that. This is, this is so sad. Just a couple generations before, Joshua has warned them. In his, in his last breaths, he's warned them. He gathered the leaders together of the nation of Israel and he reminded them of all that God had commanded him 50 years prior. And he tells them, this won't be on the screen, but he tells them in Joshua chapter 23, verse 6, to be strong, to, to be careful to obey all that's written in the law of Moses. Sound familiar? Does it sound familiar? He's quoting God from Joshua chapter 1. And then in verse 8, he tells them, hold fast to God. Whatever you do, hold fast to God. The, wind, the winds are going to come. The storm is going to blow. Hold fast to God. And then in chapter 24, verse 15, he tells them, I'm going to set the example. Do what you want to do. But me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And then you just turn two pages of your Bible. And the Israelites are doing evil in the sight of the Lord again. And now they're living with the consequences of their decisions. They're hiding in the mountains. They're buried down in caves and in strongholds while their enemy is strategically starving them out. It's not looking good for the home team. This, this promised land that they so wanted has become a wasteland. And in Judges chapter 6, verses 3 through 6, you can read this later in the week, uh, it tells us, I'll summarize it for you, that every time the Israelites would plant their crops, the Midianites, who were most likely a nomadic people, meaning they lived off the land, they would just kind of move where the resources were, the Midianites would come through and steal the Israelites' crops. And they didn't just steal their crops, they would destroy the leftovers. They would pull up the plants. And then the text tells us that they would take the sheep and the goats and the cattle and the donkeys until the land was stripped bare. That's the way the scripture describes what the Midianites were doing to the Israelites. And then verse 6 describes the reality on the ground. It says that Israel was reduced to starvation. Israelites, they were reduced to starvation by the Midianites. You know, now, okay, we've got a problem on our hands. Starvation definitely constitutes a problem. Of course, you and I know their sin has led to their starvation. But I'll bet if you and I could travel back in time to this exact moment in history, and if we were able to ask just one of the Israelites, maybe pull out a phone and record, do an interview, and we ask them, what is the biggest problem that you as a nation are facing right now? Well, they would look at us like we're idiots and they'd say, well, duh, we're starving. God has abandoned us. Do you not look around? We're hiding and we're starving. And sin, that'd be the last thing on their radar. But verse 6 continues. And then the Israelites cried out to the Lord for help. Now look at this. They cried out to the Lord for help. They didn't cry out in repentance. They cried out for help. Now, this is so encouraging to me. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter how far you've run for, from God. It doesn't matter how desperate your situation is. It doesn't even matter if you get the prayer right. <laughs> the answer is always to cry out to God for help. And what God does is he hears their prayer. And now he has to show them that the pain in their stomach isn't the problem. It's the sin in their hearts. That's the problem. Verse 7, it goes on. It says, when they cried out to the Lord because of Midian, what does the Lord do? Verse 8, the Lord sent a prophet to the Israelites. Now, I just want to point out that he did not send Truett Cathy and a truckload of Chick-fil-A. That's what they needed though, right? He, he didn't send manna from heaven, which he had done in the past. He sends a prophet, a spokesperson for God who will tell them the truth. Verse 8 continues, and this is what the prophet said. He said, this is what the Lord God of Israel says. 
God said, I brought you up out of slavery in Egypt. I rescued you from the Egyptians and from all those who opposed you. I drove you, uh, I drove out your enemies and gave you their land. I told you, I'm the Lord your God. You must not worship the gods of the Amorites in whose land you now live, but you have not listened to me. You haven't listened to me. And isn't that the real problem? I mean, sure, the land is barren. The people are hiding in caves and they can't find food for dinner tonight. But if we pause long enough to ask why, why is all this happening to them? It becomes very clear that the deeper problem is something beneath the surface, something that's actually a heart problem. God says, you have not listened to me. And that's the problem. And every parent in the room, you know exactly what God is saying. You haven't listened to me. You warn your son, do not touch the cookies. They're hot. They just came out of the oven. Don't touch them. They will burn you. And then you walk out of the kitchen and, and what does your son do? He, he, he bites into a cookie and he burns his mouth and he cries. And what do you say? While you're holding him through his tears, and you're crying too. You tell, you, you tell him, I told you they were hot. I told you, but you don't listen to mommy, right? You don't listen to daddy. I really want what's best for you. I really do. When I say don't touch the cookies, I mean don't touch the cookies. And in all reality, that's the problem all of us have, isn't it? Even as, as, as grown-ups, God says, don't touch it. Run away from it. Don't even think about it. And what do we do? <laughs> we touch the cookies. <laughs> yeah. And it's been our problem since the Garden of Eden. You have not listened to me. And today, it's no different. It's the problem that the world is facing. It's the problem that our nation is facing. God is saying, you have not listened to me. You've sacrificed your babies, 62 million of them on the altar of convenience. It's sin. You haven't listened to me. That's the problem. You've exchanged natural sexual relations for unnatural ones, and it's sin. It's the problem. You haven't listened to me. You've cheated on your spouse. You've cheated on your taxes. You've ignored the poor. You've turned a blind eye to the widow. You've forsaken the orphan and the stranger. It's sin. You haven't listened to me. That's the problem. You've kicked me out of your schools. You've thrown my laws out of your courts. You've replaced my words in your homes with the world on your screens. And it's sin. You haven't listened to me. That's the problem to which every one of us who's honest with ourselves, we say, yeah, it's true. We haven't listened to you. It's the real problem. And we're living with the consequences of our decisions. Our hands have been burnt and our father speaks. I told you it was hot. I told you, but you wouldn't listen to me. And just like the days of Gideon, our country, our churches, our families, our very hearts need to remember who God is and what our relationship is to him. Nothing short of repentance will fix the problem that our sins have caused. And if you take a moment to assess the spiritual landscape of our country, you find yourself asking, at least I do, how did we get so far? How did we get so far from your ways, God? And Paul in the New Testament, he's like, I know how. I I'll tell you how. You've redefined the truth. You've believed a lie as if it were the truth. And a lie believed to be true will affect your life as if it were true. Just think about it. In the world today, truth has become relative. 
I have my truth and you have your truth. And who's to say whose truth is true? And we live and we move and we make our decisions based on subjective truth. Standing with our feet planted firmly in the air. Wondering why the reality we see with our eyes does not, it doesn't align with the reality we know in our hearts. And that's how you get so far from God. You believe a lie as if it were the truth. And God will do what he's always done. He will let us live with the consequences until we see the folly of our ways and repent. In Romans chapter 1, Paul says it this way. He says, so God abandoned them to whatever shameful things their hearts desired. As a result, they did vile and degrading things with each other's bodies, and they traded the truth about God for a lie. See, we think we know what's best. And that's the problem. In Judges chapter 6, verse 11, God provides an answer to the problem. And he comes with really good news. God reaches down into our mess and he provides a way out. Verse 11 says this, Then the angel of the Lord came. Help is on the way. Aren't you so thankful that the Lord comes to us? That we don't have to ascend to him? We don't have to go to him? It says the angel of the Lord came. And he sat beneath the great tree of Afra. It looks like Oprah. It's Afra. And I love, I love that the scriptures describe this tree. I, I love trees. I think that me and God have that in common, apparently. He just wanted us to know that the angel sat beneath this great tree. And apparently this tree belonged to Joash of the clan of Abizer. Poor guy. He lived with that name all his life. And then Gideon... Here's our history maker. The son of Joash, he was threshing wheat at the bottom of a wine press to hide the grain from the Midianites. Verse 12, the angel of the Lord appeared to him. And I just want to point out that God can find you wherever you're hiding. In your hopelessness, in your darkness, wherever you are, where you think no one sees you, God can find you. And the Lord appeared to him, and he says, mighty hero, history maker, the Lord is with you. And you can hear the confidence in the affirmation in his voice. But at this point in his life, Gideon's just trying to get by. Gideon's just trying to make it to the next day. He's just trying to survive. He's hiding in, an, in the earth just to feed his family. And not so much out of fear, but out of necessity. You know, it's, it's just the way things are. It's just the way things are. I've accepted it. It's just, it's just how things are. You ever been there? It's just the way things are. And you don't like it. You wouldn't have picked it. But it's, it's just the way things are. I've adapted, you know. I've, I've accepted it. That's Gideon. He's hiding in the earth just trying to put some food on the table. When the angel of the Lord, he watches, he pokes his head out over the edge of the entrance to the wine press. A wine press is just this big hole in the ground where Gideon is hiding. And the first thing that this heavenly messenger does is he lifts the head of the man hiding in the dirt. You, you got to picture it. He's up above. Gideon's working down in it. And he's like, mighty hero. And the first thing Gideon has to do is look up. And in just two words, he speaks a greater truth over this history maker's life than Gideon's faith will allow him to believe. He says, mighty hero. He's yelling it down into the hole. The Lord is with you. 
And Gideon looks up and he's like, bro, you're blocking my light. If you're looking for a hero, if you're looking for a history maker, you're at the wrong wine press. This is a hideout. It's not a war room. And here comes his doubt. Look at verse 13. Sir, Gideon replied, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? You're telling me the Lord is with us? Why has all this happened? to I like Gideon. I was amening him in my office this week. You're telling me the Lord is with us? Why has all this happened to us? It's 2020. Why did 2020 happen to us? But he doesn't stop there. Gideon's like, man, if I've got the attention of somebody important upstairs, I'm going to, I'm just going to, I'm going to lay it out there. I'm going to put what's on my mind out in front of him. And you can hear his doubt. He said, uh, and where are all the miracles that our ancestors told us about? Can you hear the doubt? Didn't they say that the Lord brought us up out of Egypt? But what about right now? What about now? From what I see, from my perspective, from the circumstances on the ground, but now the Lord has abandoned us. He's handed us over to the Midianites. Yeah, thanks. No thanks, angel. You ever felt like Gideon? Why did all this happen? Where's the miracles? Where's the breakthroughs? I mean, it sure feels like God's abandoned me. And Gideon, he's got some tough questions, and I believe that they're questions that you've asked too. And you can hear the pain behind his words. But interestingly, nowhere in the story does the angel of the Lord argue with him. Nowhere in the story does the angel try to convince him that he's wrong. Instead, look at verse 14. I love this verse. Verse 14 says, Then the Lord turned to him and said, Go with the strength you have and rescue Israel from the Midianites. I am sending you. Now this verse is amazing. The text says, then the Lord turned to him. I just got to call time out. Time out. Hold on a second. In case you, you, you might have missed it. I need to point something out. That everything in this story just changed in verse 14. Everything just changed. Are you t if, you're, if you're not taking notes, you should be taking notes. Verse 14, you just need to mark this in your Bibles. You need to highlight it. You need to underline it. All this time, Gideon has been talking to the angel of the Lord. Gideon is down in the wine press, and the angel of the Lord is up above, sitting under a tree, talking to Gideon. And Gideon has been complaining to the angel of the Lord about the Lord. The Lord has abandoned us. Isn't that right? That's what he's been doing. He's been complaining. Now look closely at verse 14. It says, the Lord... It no longer says the angel of the Lord. Now that caught my attention. I looked that up. It turns out that the Lord is Jehovah. So the text should actually read the Lord God turned to him. Meaning that Gideon is no longer talking to some angel. He's talking to Christ. That the Lord God is in the room. That Gideon, he doesn't, but he doesn't even know it yet. That Jesus Christ is in the room. So Gideon is complaining to the angel about the Lord, but he's actually complaining to the Lord about the Lord. Y'all, I find that so comforting. I do. God can handle your honesty. He can handle it. And when you think about how few people in the Bible actually saw the Lord, do you see how this verse changes everything? 
Apparently, this problem and this person are pretty important to God. One more amazing thing. You might have just glanced right over it. This is so amazing. Look at verse 14 again. If you just read over it once, you might not catch it. But it says, then the Lord turned to him. Turned to him. Now, other translations say that the Lord looked in his eyes. Looked him in his eyes. Now, help me out here. How does an angel hollering down from the top of a wine press turn to him? See, Gideon is down in this hole and this heavenly being is up on the ledge. So how does the Lord look Gideon in the eyes? I'll tell you how. I hope you're listening. Jesus is down in the hole with him. Jesus is down in the dirt. Christ was in the wine press. That's how. And he always was. The Lord could turn to him because he was right there with him. He was always. It's just that good. And there, face to face, Gideon, this is what he says. Uh, go, I'm sorry, he says to Gideon, go with the strength that you have. And rescue Israel from the Midianites. I am sending you. Gideon, I need a history maker. And you are the one. You're the one. Listen, church, God's word, God's commission is his provision. Every single time. The Lord says, go with the strength that you have. Meaning, I have given you everything you need to win. I've provided you with all the strength that you need. My word is your way. Woo! My word is your way. Your commission is your provision. And yet Gideon, he's just like so many of us. Even with Jesus in the room, even with Jesus in my heart, even with this promise in my hands, we still doubt, don't we? We still doubt. We still waver. Look at Gideon's response in verse 15. But Lord, Gideon replied, how can I rescue Israel? My clan is the weakest in the whole tribe of Manasseh, and I am the least in my entire family. And don't for a second mistake Gideon's doubt for humility. This is not humility. This is doubt. And Christ tells him, you're the one. You've got this. I'm with you. Let's roll. And Gideon's like, you must not know me, Lord. You must not know me. I'm a nobody. And I come from a long line of nobodies. How can a nobody rescue Israel? But God is, he's so patient with Gideon, and God is patient with you. Because God knows that doubt, when it is dealt with, when it is defeated, doubt becomes an infusion of faith. Verse 16, the Lord said to him, I will be with you. I will be with you. And again, you can hear the confidence. You can hear the affirmation of Christ speaking into his history maker. And you will destroy the Midianites as if you were fighting against one man. And Gideon replies, doubtful Gideon replies, if you're, if you're, if you're truly going to help me, show me a sign. Show me a sign. Prove that this is really the Lord speaking to me. And so God shows him a sign. God is, is so patient with us. Gideon is not getting it, but God is meeting Gideon where he is. Skip down to verse 22, because God knows that if he can just get us to realize, if he can just get you to realize who he is and what you have available to you, that it would change everything in your life. Look at verse 22. It says, when Gideon realized who he was talking to, when Gideon realized that it was the angel of the Lord, when Gideon realized who he was talking, I don't know who this is going to speak to, but maybe you've been praying with a spirit of doubt. 
Oh, Lord, if it be thy will. And today, just like Gideon, you're going to realize who you're talking to. Or maybe you've been fighting what you know to be God's will for your life. And today, just like Gideon, you're going to realize who you're talking to. Or maybe you've been living a life of rebellion, of rebellion and refusing to listen to God. And today, just like Gideon, you're going to realize who you're talking to and you're going to repent. Or maybe you've been plagued with doubt. You know, should I? I mean, should I try? Should I stand up? Should I speak out? Should I go for it? And today, just like Gideon, you're going to realize who you're talking to. Because when you know who you talk, when, when you know who you're talking to, when you know who is in your corner, when you realize who God is, what God has done, that he's right there with you in the wine press, your doubt gets turned inside out. And your fear turns into an infusion of faith. That's what happened for Gideon. Later that night, the Lord gave Gideon his first orders as a history maker. He tells Gideon, it's a, you're about to go from hiding to fighting, Gideon. You're about to take your first swing at the devil. And God tells Gideon, I want you to take a seven-year-old bull that belongs to your dad. I want you to tie that bull to your dad's altar to Baal. I want you to pull down that false god. I want you to tear down the gods of your family. That's strong. But that wasn't all. Then God tells Gideon, I want you to cut down the Asherah pole that's standing right there next to the altar. And God's about to go savage, okay? And he orders his new history maker to build an altar from the altar you just tore down and to sacrifice that bull on it. I want you to take that Asherah pole, I want you to cut it up and use it as the firewood as a sacrifice of praise to me. Woo! He's taking ground, okay? He's teaching Gideon to swing for the fence. He's showing Gideon, you can throat punch the devil, bro. You don't have to hesitate. When you realize who I am, when you realize who's in your corner, you can be a history maker. And Gideon does exactly what God told him to do. And the next morning, the people of the town, they come out, they see this abomination, and they want to kill Gideon. But Gideon's dad was inspired by his son. And he stands up for his son, and he says this, you know what? If Baal is truly a god, let him defend himself. If these gods that we've been worshiping, if they really are gods, they can defend themselves. And it looks like, it looks like Gideon, he's not the only one who's beginning to realize. Someone else is beginning to realize. Just like doubt is contagious, how many of you know that faith is contagious too? And Gideon's dad, he steps in front of this angry mob. He risks his life and he says, if Baal is a god, he can defend himself. And the faith of the son was contagious to the father. And Gideon's doubt, y'all, Gideon's doubt, it was not the end of his story. Look at verse 32. This is how we will end today. It says, and from that day on, Gideon was called Jerubbabel. He, He got a nickname. From that day on, which means let Baal defend himself because he had broken down Baal's altars. He had taken down the problem. Gideon's doubt was not the end of his story. And your doubt, it doesn't have to be the story you write either. God is inviting you to live out, to lean into his story. See, when Gideon realized who he was talking to and who was standing with him, his doubt got worked out. And he went from hiding in the ground 
to pulling false gods down. He became what God saw in him, a mighty hero, mighty hero, history maker. And today I believe with all my heart that God is looking for history makers who will move the world from where it is to where God wants it to be, who will choose to obey God standing on his word. And even when the world, even when the world around them has bought the lie, when they've traded in the truth of God for a lie, they stand. They realize who's in their corner. So don't let doubt. Don't let the lies of your adversary keep you holed up in a wine press. Don't waste your life hiding from your fight. Listen to the Spirit's leading in your life. And when you don't feel like you're a history maker, realize who spoke you into existence. Realize who has been with you every step of the way. Realize who is with you right now. Realize whose word is enough. Realizes, realize whose promise you are standing on and climb out of your doubt into the story that God intended you to live. Move the world. Push back the darkness. Take new ground. You're a history maker. That's what you do. Can we pray together? Lord, your spirit is moving among us. Have your way. With every head bowed in an attitude of prayer, I know that for some of us who came to church today, we feel a little bit like Gideon when the angel of the Lord leaned over the edge and he's like, mighty hero, the Lord is with you. And Gideon's like, what? Mighty? Doubt filled his mind. And maybe you made a decision to follow Christ, but you find yourself hiding in the wine press, saying, God, I don't feel like I have what it takes. I've come from a long line of nobodies. And yet in 2020, God wants you to climb out of your doubt and step into his story. Step into the calling that he's given you because he's looking for history makers today. And if you're here today or if you're watching this message online and you're ready to say, I want to be a history maker in this land. God, take my life. Write your story with it. If that's you, would you join me in raising your hand right now? I want to be God's history maker. Heavenly Father, you, you see every hand. More importantly, you know every heart. Remind us. Help us to realize, like Gideon, who it is that's calling us into a greater story. And when the lies of our enemy and the doubts of this world bring us down, would you lift us up? Lift us up with patience. Lift us up with new confidence and Holy Spirit affirmation. We pray repentance over our nation. We pray repentance over our churches. We pray repentance over our families. We pray repentance over our hearts in this moment. Thank you for hearing our prayers. Thank you for coming to us when we could never get to you. Thank you for inviting us into your story. As we continue praying, some of you are not living for God. In fact, you'd be the first to say it. I've been living for me and only me. I've never listened to God. I've lived in complete rebellion to him. And today I want to repent of my sin. I feel God's love reaching out to me and inviting me into a greater story. If that's you, I want you to know this is your moment. It's why you're here today. God has a purpose for your life and his ultimate purpose for you is to know him and to be known by him. He loves you. And he wants you to love him. That's the good news. The bad news is that sin separates us from God. My sin, your sin, it separates us from a holy God. Sin is the problem. But the good news is that God provided an answer to our problem in the person of Jesus. See, God sent his son Jesus into the world to live a perfect life, 
to die on the cross that you and I deserved and to be raised from the grave three days later. Why? So that you would have the chance today to no longer be separated from God so that today you could begin an eternal relationship with him. If you're here and you say, yeah, I need his forgiveness. I need his grace. I give my life to him. I don't belong to me anymore. I've seen what I can do with my life. It's time to see what God can do with my life. If that's you, don't let the devil talk you out of it. Raise your hands right now. That's my prayer. I'm giving my life to Christ. And let's pray together. Everyone prays aloud. No one prays alone. Heavenly Father, I'm a sinner and I need a Savior. Jesus, only you can save me. Only you can change me. Only you can transform me. Only you can solve the mess I've made. Would you forgive me? Would you take my life and make it yours? I give it to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Stand together, church. Let's worship.
Every heart says, thank you, Jesus. Every heart says, thank you, Jesus. Thank you for the cross, Lord. Thank you for your love. Thank you for a grace we could never deserve. Thank you for a love we could never earn. Thank you for knowing us and still loving us. Thank you for knowing us and still having a plan for us. Thank you that you are amidst us, among us right now, and you're moving and you're having your way, Jesus. We say thank you, just a heart of gratitude. We bow before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords with a heart of repentance. We say have your way.